in July 2019, USA Today reported the author of an influential evangelical book that decried modern dating as a training ground for divorce has himself divorced his wife and renounced his Christian faith. The book the article references was I Kissed Dating Goodbye, and its author, Joshua Harris. Harris said this on social media, the popular phrase for this is deconstruction, the biblical phrase is falling away. By all the measurements that I have for defining a Christian, I am not a Christian. Many in the evangelical world were shocked. Joshua Harris had become a poster child for evangelicals. He was raised in the church. He was homeschooled. In fact, Tim Challey says this of him. Joshua Harris was born in 1974, the first child of Greg and Sano Harris. His parents were pioneers in the Christian homeschooling movement, which was only in its infancy while Josh and his siblings were growing up. Greg's book, The Christian Homeschool, was a foundational text for homeschoolers and a Christian Booksellers Association best-selling title in 1988. He had by... All appearances, parents who were spiritual influencers, all the markers of a successful Christian life himself. He was popular. His book, Encouraging Young People to Kiss Dating Goodbye, released in the late 1990s, sold a million copies. So what happened? What happened? Harris and prominent departures like him remind us that false conversion is real. They teach us that this is a real modern phenomenon just as it was a real ancient phenomenon. False conversion will either be revealed to the sinner's own heart, resulting in repentance, or resulting in a hardened heart toward the things of God. Most times we encounter that response. It is a private falling away, and the false professor becomes a quiet agnostic, or they'll embrace some form of false spirituality over time. But sometimes one who has professed Christ but has not truly repented sees opportunity in betraying the Lord they once walked with. And we know that those who die in this state of renouncing Christ will pay the penalty of their sins in a place called hell. To say it's an uncomfortable truth would be an understatement. I mean, how is it even possible to have a picturesque Bible-believing family where everything from family devotions to education and worship in the local church all promote and encourage good theology and practice, and yet have someone emerge in that context worse than an unbeliever. And we know because the Bible paints a picture of apostasy that for those who know the truth and depart from it, their end will be worse even than others who die in their sins and go to hell. All who die without faith in Christ will perish eternally, but those who die opposing Christ with a high hand and leading others to follow them over the cliff, for them it would be better if they had never been born. In fact, even when they cause true believers to stumble, it's a fearful thing. Jesus said this in Matthew eighteen six. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Can you imagine that that kind of an end to your life would be better than something else? But in order to understand what happened with Harris and others like him, we need to look at the biblical picture of apostasy. There is, in fact, someone far more infamous, trained for ministry. You see, even Harris became a pastor over time. But there was someone far more infamous, trained for ministry more perfectly than you or I ever could be, who experienced the work of God as few ever have, who saw healings never before seen since the foundation of the world, who watched the compassion of Jesus for the lost and for him, who knew that Jesus walked on water and calmed the storm. And yet he turned his back on Christ. And we can say of him, he kissed Jesus goodbye, quite literally, as the Gospels tell us. He betrayed him and led others to come against him. We find a description of him in the Gospels, and we're going to see his story today in the Gospel of Matthew. So turn there with me. The beginning of this story of a disciple who was not a true disciple, 
of a friend who was not a true friend, of a brother who was not a true brother, and of a Christian who was not a true Christian, and of an apostle who was not a true apostle, is the commissioning of the disciples. Look at Matthew 4. In verse 18 onward says this, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon who was called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father. They were mending their nets and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. The disciples who followed Jesus set aside much to follow him. And they heard his amazing teaching. We see that in the next several chapters in the Sermon on the Mount. Then if you look over in Matthew 9, we read that the gospel writer here, Matthew himself, talks of his call. Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. We turn then to Matthew 10 for the whole summoning of the twelve. And it says this, Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. This description of this betrayer, Judas Iscariot, is what we will study today. Between this clear statement of betrayal in chapter 10 and our passage in chapter 26, where we're going to be today, we don't read of Judas Iscariot at all, which is to say he just blended into the background with the other disciples. He was one of them. Nothing really distinguished him in the public view. So turn then to Matthew 26. Early in this chapter, we learned of Mary of Bethany, who had done such a kindness for the Lord that he said in verse 13, Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Now, as we saw in Matthew 10, Judas was described simply as the one who betrayed him. What a contrast to have forever as the gospel is proclaimed, as the Bible is preached, that there was one who betrayed Christ who was close to him. And there was one of his followers who loved Christ and she would be remembered in such a wonderful way. What went wrong Is apostasy preventable? What can we learn about this tragedy of this soul that is set on betrayal? Verse 14 of chapter 26 says, Then one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, What will you be willing to give me to betray him to you? Multiple times in the Gospels, we read that the leaders of the people sought opportunity to betray Christ, but could not find just the right time or the right place. Verse 4 and 5 tell us they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him, but they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur among the people. Through all their conspiring, they had not figured out the best way to put Jesus to death. But in their wickedness, it seems that opportunity was given to them. Listen to Matthew Henry. He says this, Those that give up themselves to be led by the devil find him readier than they imagine to help them at a deadlift, as Judas did the the chief priests. Though the rulers by their power and interest could kill him when they had him in their hands, yet none but a disciple could betray him. Note the greater profession men make of religion and the more they are employed in the study and service of it, the greater opportunity they have of doing mischief if their hearts be not right with God. If Judas had not been an apostle, he could not have been a traitor. If men had known the way of righteousness, they could never have abused it. 
I've often told people that just because there's an op- open door to do something does not necessarily mean it's of the Lord. Wicked men all the time seek opportunity to sin. And we know the enemy lines up for ways for them to indulge their sins. And so it was for the chief priests, those leaders of leaders among the teachers of Israel. They earnestly sought opportunity to fulfill the desires of their iniquity. And the devil worked through Judas to provide that opening. As Matthew Henry points out, a defector is always the preferred agent to betray an enemy. You know this in, real, in, in, in modern life, don't you? It was the case in ancient life also. The defector knows the ins and outs of the operation. In Judah's case, he knows the routines of the men he spent three and a half years with. He knows where they minister. He knows where and when they pray. He knows where and when they rest. He knows how often they worship in the temple. He knows the synagogues they frequent. He would even know when they moved from place to place, the kinds of activities they would be involved in, and how many hours of the day they ministered to the lost and the sick and the needy. When Mary had poured out expensive perfume on Jesus' head and wiped his feet with her hair, verse 9 reminds us that the disciples, learned, uh, led by Judas, as we fi- found out in John, the disciples were mad about it, saying, For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and money given to the poor. But John 12, 6 tells us Judas wasn't concerned about the poor at all. Now, he said this, the text says, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to pilfer what was put into it. That fact means that in addition to all the other goings on that Judas knew about, he knew everything to do with the gifts that came to the disciples and the giving even that the disciples actually used in service to the poor. The betrayer was the treasurer. And yet, if you look on the whole of Jesus' time with the disciples, he was not in Jesus' inner circle. We see that Peter, James, and John were closer personally to Christ. But for the chief priests themselves, far from the heart of God and the heart of Christ, Judas would do. And Judas asked them, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? He's gone from receiving gifts for the ministry of the Messiah to pilfering those monies, robbing the ministry, and now soliciting blood money as the price for the life of Jesus. This is a wicked man. Up to this point, he has been a thief without consequence. The only ones harmed didn't even know they were missing anything, save for the Lord. But the disciples and the poor to whom they ministered were none the wiser. But as sin always begets sin... And iniquity always leads to greater iniquity, and evil always increases unabated. Judas waxed worse and worse until his vice led him to become a conspirator in the murder of Jesus. What was his master worth? Zechariah 11, 12, speaking prophetically, says, So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. And what do we find in our text? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. Now, Zechariah 11, talking of 30 pieces of silver, might not have immediately been recognized as prophetically pointing to Judas, except that Zechariah 11:13 says, I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. That part will become evident in Matthew 27. When Judas returns after betraying Jesus and throws the blood money into the temple for his gift. And where did they spend the money? On the potter's field. Again and again, we see how many details were known in ancient times and fulfilled one prophetic word after another in the New Testament. Well, Judas must have been convincing as a betrayer because they immediately gave him the price of his treachery. They weighed out 30 pieces of silver. There's no evidence in the text that there was any sort of, well, how do we really know you're going to betray him? How do we really know you're not someone who loves him? Judas, though evidently portraying himself to be a believer among the believers, was easily able to show 
those other deceivers his deceit. What would 30, what would 30 pieces of silver purchase? Exodus 21, 32 tells us this was the price of a slave. That was his worth to Jesus, uh, to, to Judas. That was Jesus' worth to Judas. And it was Jesus' worth to the chief priests, the price of a slave. And verse 16 says, from then on he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. And the verb here, zeteo, is not just looking in its typical sense of watching, It's a verb that means to attempt to attain some state or condition. That's how the lexicon renders it. To attempt to attain some state or condition. Judas sought to achieve his desired goal of betrayal. He was not going to let it go until he had accomplished that. And he did so with full privileges of the nearness that he had to Christ. You could say Judas used the nearness of Christ to betray him. You might even say that no one was ever closer to Jesus who betrayed him save Lucifer who used to bask in the glories of heaven. And Judas, like his father the devil, was so close and yet so incredibly far from a right relationship with the Lord. There are always those among us who are that far away from the Lord in their heart. Maybe not to such an an extent where the Lord will allow them such wicked deeds, but certainly they are so far from confessing Christ in a true sense. And so we see there that Judas had proposed this betrayal. What is the actual price of betrayal? It was 30 pieces of silver. What's the purpose of the betrayal? And here we have to have a sovereign picture. We have to have a picture of God's operation in all of this. With all that went into the conspiracy to end the Messiah's ministry, you and I must remember that the Lord uses all things to fulfill His purposes. And while Judas had a senseless goal for his life to accumulate wealth and for wealth's sake only, God always has a purpose behind man's evil. If you don't believe that, you do not believe in the God of Scripture. In Genesis 50, when Jacob died, you'll remember that Joseph's brothers were fearful Joseph's brothers had sold Joseph when in Canaan to the Ishmaelites, and the Ishmaelites then sold him into Egypt to Potiphar. And this was a real betrayal. But at the end of his life, Joseph, of course, had brought his whole family, including his father and all of the brothers and their wives and their children. And he had provided refuge for them and food for them because there was a great famine over the land, really saved their lives. But when Jacob died, when Israel died, they feared Joseph surely now is going to turn around and return what we did to him on us. And what did Joseph tell them? Joseph said, do you think that this was my intent? And he says, he actually speaks in in Genesis 50, 20. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You did do wickedly in your heart, and yet your wickedness was used by God even for your good and for mine and for our people's. What an incredible perspective that Joseph had and we need to have. And I, I, I bring that to your attention because while wicked men commit great acts of evil against Christ and against His church, what they mean for evil against us, God means for good. Everything that's happened in the past several years, as we've seen wickedness unfold across the world, what they mean for evil, God means for good. And for your good in particular, dear Christian, and for His glory in particular. What Judas meant for evil against the Messiah, Jesus Christ, God had long ago in ancient times planned for the good of the world. You see, Jesus had to go to the cross in order to atone for sin. And so his betrayal was known in eternity past. And because of this, Jesus continues to plan for the institution of the new covenant. And that's what we see next is the purposes of Christ are still being carried out. Verse 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Now stop there for a moment. The Passover. 
This is a word which is just rich with meaning. From Old Testament to New, before the cross, during the cross, after the cross, and forever the Passover will have incredible meaning. It's a very important story in the life of Israel. But of course, the Passover that Jesus is preparing for in this week is not just going to be like another Passover. It will be more like the first Passover. So you know Israel has been celebrating the Passover year by year, even when they were scattered in various places. Year by year they celebrate. But there's something about this new Passover that's more like the first. Where all Israel were saved from the grip of Pharaoh's tyranny. And the death of the firstborn child in Egypt would be the price for the sins that were committed. And in particular, the sins of the Egyptians who hated God's people. There would be a price of the death of the firstborn. Every other Passover since that per- Passover had a twofold purpose. So all the memorial Passovers, all of these feasts and festivals, year by year that went on, they had these purposes. First, the purpose was to commemorate the great deliverance of Yahweh and His power to save with an outstretched arm, with, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He redeemed them from Egypt. That was always to be remembered, looking to the past at God's great work. But there was a second reason the Passover was to be celebrated, and that was looking forward to the final Passover, the final Passover lamb that would be slain for the sins of His people. And that, of course, pointed to the Messiah Himself, Jesus Christ. He would atone for His sins once and for all. And the Lord God would pass over all who applied the blood of His cross to the door of their hearts. Has the blood of His cross been applied to the door of your heart? You know that in Egypt, if the blood was applied to the doorpost and the lintel, that the Lord would pass over that house and they would be saved. And that's what happened for all Israel. They, they all had applied the blood and they were saved. Well, so it is with Christ. And 1 Corinthians 5, 7 calls our Lord... Christ, our Passover. And so despite betrayal in the background, Jesus in the foreground is pressing forward to this fateful day of the crucifixion. And so verse 18, he says, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. If only Judas had believed Jesus as the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, he would not made, he would not have made the Passover his final time in this world. That one fateful Passover would be his last. He would not have suffered as he did in the end. Judas betrayed Christ for gain, as all apostates do, now as then. In his case, it was for 30 pieces of silver. What would your betrayal price be if you could betray Christ? We all have to know, are we His? Or are we pretending? My daughter was reminding me earlier, there are those who are connected to the church and those converted She had learned that in a message at camp at one time, and she said it really convicted her. It was part of her testimony of how she came to Christ. Are you just connected to the church or are you converted? And that's kind of the idea, what we look at here. 30 pieces of silver. If not riches for Christ, then recognition for Christ, or friends for Christ, or anger for Christ, or lust for Christ. Ultimately, it is whatever sin allures you most, That's what you trade for Christ. That's how apostasy comes. J.C. Ryle says this, We ought to observe these things. They are deeply humbling and instructive. Like Lot's wife, Judas is intended to be a beacon to the whole church. Let us often think about him and say as we think, Search me, O Lord, and try my heart, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Let us resolve by God's grace that we will never be content with anything short of sound, thorough heart conversion. Let us learn from these verses that the love of money is one of the greatest snares to a man's soul. We cannot conceive a clearer proof of this than in the case of Judas. That wretched question, what will you give me, reveals the secret sin which was his ruin. 
He had given up much for Christ's sake, but he had not given up his covetousness. The words of the Apostle Paul should often ring in our ears about the love of money as the root of all evil. The history of the church abounds in illustrations of this truth. For money, Joseph was sold by his brethren. For money, Samson was betrayed to the Philistines. For money, Gehazi deceived Naaman and lied to Elisha. For money, Ananias and Sapphira tried to deceive Peter. For money, the Son of God was delivered into the hands of wicked men. Astonishing indeed does it seem that the cause of so much evil should be loved so well. The cause of so much evil is so loved by men. Henry adds to Ryle saying it is not the lack of money, but the love of money that is the root of all evil. Judas had everything with Christ. He had everything he needed. He was well fed. He was well clothed. He had all provision. He was welcome into every special place that Jesus was welcome. Into such places as Simon the leper to enjoy fellowship as we saw recently. He lacked nothing while he walked with Christ. And so in the end we learn that if we do not walk with Christ in spirit and in truth. We remain empty. We remain unsatisfied. We remain unfulfilled. We remain rudderless and lack direction, and we struggle to find joy. And if we do not look to Christ for salvation, we will seek our satisfaction somewhere outside of Him, somewhere outside of the church. Though Joshua Harris himself believed his leadership in the evangelical church caused harm by preaching the evangelical message and selling books about purity culture, He now sees himself as a leader out of evangelicalism. So listen to this. He preached a message he never believed and now apologizes for it. Now he wants to preach a new message and get you to trust him that he's your leader out of these troubles. Listen to how Carl Truman detects something critical in understanding Joshua Harris' drift. Joshua Harris, he says, is... Back in the the limelight, this was written a year or two ago. He says he's back in the limelight. He made his name as the young author of I Kissed Dating Goodbye and was thereby a key inspiration for the purity movement in evangelical, American evangelicalism. Then after a stint as a pastor of an evangelical megachurch in Gaithersburg, he left the ministry, repudiated the book and the teaching that had given him his platform and abandoned the faith. But, says Truman, this is America... And if you have lemons, you make lemonade. Harris is now back on stage peddling his latest venture, a five-part course helping you to handle the damage that purity culture and religious legalism, as promoted by the earlier Harris, may have done to your life. Harris seems to have retained at least one habit of American evangelicalism, always being just a little too late to the cutting-edge cultural party. But perhaps I'm too harsh I am told that some people still somewhere listen to the Backstreet Boys. So the 90s are probably still in fashion somewhere. A man with greater sense of self-doubt, not to say appropriate shame, might have decided that someone else would be better qualified to apply the balm of Gilead to the wounds of his earlier victims. I did damage, great damage. Now I want to lead you so that if you've been damaged, you can be helped. This is, this is the way of the charlatan. This is the way of the apostate today. Harris himself actually earlier on to news organizations admitted that earlier in his life he wanted fame and popularity. He wanted to be a best-selling author and leader. Well, he got those things. Perhaps the devil will give him more than he could have ever dreamed of while he counted himself a follower of Christ, but I pray not. Now he's still living, and I pray that you pray not. We pray for the souls of men in that state. I pray he repents and is not, in the end, just another Judas Iscariot. Math, uh, Mark 8 36 and th- 37 and 38 says this For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him 
when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. How do we learn from this in the church? And how does this apply to modern day defectors and apostates who leave the church and use their experience to rail against Christ and his bride? There have been a lot of responses, evaluations, analyses of these deconstructing evangelicals, ex-evangelicals, apostates, however you want to label them. I prefer the biblical term, apostate. Many have focused on certain clues that could have indicated their drift or the influences of their lives and what might have gone wrong. But if pastors and church leaders want to respond with steadfastness and hope, it will not do to focus on these kinds of failures and subjectively dissect them. We cannot reverse engineer apostasy as though a simple cause and effect relationship exists between external and internal influences and the departure. The practice of looking for a unique cause and effect relationship leading to a falling away is an inherently Arminian exercise. As though with the right checks and balances along the way, someone could have been prevented from unbelief. But unbelief is the cause of apostasy, not the effect. True faith is not held on to by any man. Neither the individual professor nor those who influence them have that kind of power. You don't have the kind of power it takes to hold you in your faith. Only Christ Hold you. No one will pluck you out of my hands. No one will pluck you out of the Father's hands. That's what Jesus said, right? That means that not even you can pull yourself out of his hands. If you are in Christ, you are secure. The strength of his hand secures you. And so we look not to simply modern day examples, but we look to the most infamous of all professors who was a false convert and a false disciple of Christ. 2,000 years ago, this ragtag bunch among sinners, tax collectors, and troublemakers by trade were called by Jesus to become his followers. One of those disciples whose mutiny in his heart was only known to Christ was Judas Iscariot. Judas looked and played the part of a disciple along with the rest and became well known to the crowds. As surely as Peter would be recognized the night of Jesus' betrayal, the night of his arrest, he'd be recognized as one who, in fact, was among the disciples. Surely Judas also would be recognized as somebody who was just one of that group. Judas was also known beyond those borders of Jerusalem. He's known all over the country as a disciple of Jesus. But I want you to hear this because I think there's too much that's put into, oh, that you know what happened with that person who fell away? Well, they had a, a parent that really didn't get it right with the gospel or they, had, uh, they didn't have very good teaching in school or on and on. We try to find a reason, almost like an excuse for why they did what they did, as though they do not bear the responsibility. But listen, there is no seminary that could prepare a man for ministry as Judas was prepared, or Joshua for that matter. There is no personal discipleship that anyone could receive that would outdo the preparation of Judas. This should give us pause before accusing any ministry or method or any church or influence of being the reason someone jettisons their profession of faith. Judas was trained in the most incredible ways by the master himself. Joshua was not trained in that same way. That personal, day-by-day training, year-by-year training of the master of Judas. Imagine we could approximate in our church the level of teaching that Jesus gave to his disciples. And obviously our prayer is that we do imitate his teaching as best we can. But even if we could achieve the quality and frequency that is approaching, very, very similar to that of the quality of the Lord's teaching, Would that in itself prevent apostasy? If sitting at the feet of Jesus did not eliminate the rebellion of the heart of Judas, who are we to think we can avoid such things? Obviously, we look at the many churches teaching false messages, and of course, if you want to have an apostate factory, you can do so. 
you just preach a false gospel and you can do so. But I'm talking about churches faithfully proclaiming the truth of Christ, preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth. As Jesus told us, the tares will grow up among the wheat until the time of the harvest. And so there's a number of critical truths that we've got to bear in mind here. I'll give you four. You could, you could definitely see in the text many more than these. But, but for today, we'll go through four. The first is for each of us personally. We must repent if we are to be used of Christ without hypocrisy. Our heart of unbelief is such that without willingness to bow the knee to the king, no amount of even the best teaching can save you. No amount of the best training, no amount of the best discipleship is going to make you a Christian if you don't bow the knee to King Jesus. The second is for us as a church to recognize that we do not save anyone, much less make them savable. We are not responsible if we have faithfully preached the gospel and those who hear it reject it. If I thought that the quality of my sermons meant the difference between someone having life in Christ or being damned, I would go crazy. I would have anxiety all day long. If it were up to me to get the, the message convincing enough, no, the only reason I can stand here with any confidence at all is because it's the Word of God that has power. I have no power. The Holy Spirit works through His Word to convict sinners and convince them of the truth. Convince them of sin and, unrighteous, sin and righteousness. But I'm comforted by the fact that sometimes on my worst days, when I preach something where I think I don't even know if that helped anybody, sometimes those are the days where people will come up and say, praise God, I never really understood this before. And I just think, well, how does that work? If I think I throw a dud and someone is ministered to, why is that happening? Because it is a supernatural work, the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, because it's the Word of God that has the power. And the Spirit is behind all of that. I think many, many preachers could tell you over the years, there's no rhyme or reason between the Sunday in 2020 and the Sunday in 2024 in terms of effort put into the message, in terms of prayer put into the message, in terms of what you hope to achieve with the message. The difference is the Lord. He's the one that does that. And so we have to recognize, even as we minister to those and we, we proclaim the gospel to those, it's not us that is responsible to save. It's the Lord who is responsible to save. But we need to use the implements then, right? We need to use this if we're going to see lives saved or we have no hope. Third, we cannot reject everything an apostate did now or did in his past as being bad in light of where they end up. The apostates will always... And I think this is a real common thing nowadays is you'll see somebody who has gone astray and people will look back and say, ah, they were too uh, strict in their theology or something like that. And I think that's a, a big mistake. For example, if someone, A, once strongly promoted sexual purity and then B, ended up championing immorality, as even Joshua Harris now is promoting LGBT stuff, you don't therefore look back at his promotion of purity and say, well, you know what? Let's not promote purity because look where he ended up. That's absurd. The truth is he didn't believe his own words. He didn't believe the word of God. Just because he said something means nothing if he didn't believe it. And so we don't soften the Bible's stance on sin because someone claimed to hold a biblical view and lost it. Rather, we recognize that while they professed righteousness, there was a root of sin, and their sin was made evident through their drift. Something had their heart, and it wasn't Christ. And I just want to make a, a point here. How, what was the price of the purchase of Judas' rebellion, of his, of his betrayal? It was 30 pieces of silver. What was the price of your purchase on the cross. Do you know we sang about it earlier? Two wonders here that I confess my worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. Do you know the cost of your purchase? And yet, so many 
among us would sell Christ for 30 pieces of silver. How absurd is that? How absurd. Well, fourth, we can be comforted to know that just as those first disciples were betrayed by a brother, if we are likewise faced with a brother or sister who defects, who rejects Jesus and us, that God will use that also to further and not hinder the gospel. If the closest of Jesus' companions face such betrayal by, Jesus, by Judas and not only survived but went on with greater vigor and purpose to proclaim the good news to the ends of the earth, then that's the example that we're privileged to follow. It's the example of faithfulness in light of all that's going on around them. What others do around us is irrelevant. In fact, it's, it's better than irrelevant what they meant for evil, God meant for good. And so we follow not the example of those who fall away and apostatize, but of those who preach the truth and finish the course. We follow them in as much as they follow Christ. Be sure you know, as Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. It's really not up to everybody else to determine if you're a believer if you know him, you know your heart. You know even this moment if you are not in Christ. You know this moment if you have refused to believe. Don't let that turn into outward apostasy. Recognize the sin of unbelief. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Let's pray. God, it's a harrowing tale. All that went on to Jesus, the betrayal, the arrest, the sentencing, the crucifixion. But the betrayal itself was a particular evil. We know that these evils will come, but woe to those through whom they come. I think of all the children that are raised in the families in this church and how precious they are. Little image bearers, those made in the image of God, raised to know you. I pray that for each of them, even today, that they would search their hearts and recognize they can have all the wonderful things of a believing home, of a mother and father who love Christ, who tell them the Bible is wonderful and show them that fact, and yet still they can have a heart of unbelief. God, for anyone who is here who is struggling with that and really doesn't even know what to do, let them pray as the sinner did. I believe, help my unbelief. Let them see the work of Christ on the cross. Let them know that indeed He has purchased their salvation. And let them have that great assurance. I pray also for those who lack assurance today but are yours. I pray that you would grant to them by the study of your word and perhaps the counsel of brothers and sisters here, they could have that great assurance to know that they are yours. Help them, Lord, as they serve in the church and as they minister among those here, that they would recognize that indeed you're using them for your glory. Everybody at times can have that sense of wonder, Lord, am I really yours? Even we read about John Newton, a great author of Amazing Grace, and how he wondered at times, and he said, Lord, if you have not saved me, make you yours, and begin that work in me today. But if I am yours, let me have that great assurance. And we thank you, Lord, that we're, we've been given this wonderful opportunity as a church to be together, to gather, and to proclaim your truth. We pray that each one would go from here today with much to meditate on. These are serious things, but I pray that they would result in joy. I pray that the end is not to, to result in despair, not knowing where we're at, but rather to say, no, there is a God. He has sent His Son. He's died for me, I believe. We pray this with all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.